In the 1970s, we had the Roe v. Wade decision in the United States. Uh, it was a decision uh, relating, relating to a woman's right to have an abortion. It introduced the trimester framework. It basically allowed first trimester abortions, made it very difficult to have third trimester abortions. Uh, and uh, essentially, this was really met very quickly thereafter with a sort of backlash. And really, the last 40, 50 years of American history have more or less been uh, a backlash against Roe v. Wade and an attempt to kind of criminalize abortion in all sorts of interesting ways without overturning the decision facially. So that's kind of the legal playing field, and we can talk about some of the specifics. But the more interesting question, I think, is thinking about the morality of abortion. And I'll say that I think abortion is an extremely difficult question. So one of the first questions people have to think about is, are fetuses persons? Now that's a very important linguistic question, persons. I didn't say human beings, I didn't say alive. Those are three different issues, right? Something can be alive, but not be a person. Your dog is a good example. You might love your dog, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not a person. Something can be human and potentially not be a person, right? Some people think uh, the early embryo, for example, uh, before 14 days, uh, or stem cells being derived are members of the human species, but may not be persons. So what do we mean by persons? We mean something that has a certain set of moral and or legal rights, the most important of which is a right against inviability. They can't be killed or destroyed or harmed without very good reason. And we have the attitude that we're all persons, right? So we have an index case, we're pretty clear we're persons, and the question is who else is a person? Well, to answer that, you need to have a theory about what makes something a person. And there are a few different kinds of theories you can have. One could be just to say, if X is living and a human being, X is a person, right? Now, some people have problems with that. So Peter Singer and some animal rights advocates, for example, think that that's a speciesist attitude, that by saying human equals person, it's problematic that we're excluding animals. Instead, we ought to have some criteria that looks at capacity. So other people have sometimes what are called a capacity X view, where they say, in order to be a person, you have to have X capacity. And then we have to fill in what X is. Is it the ability to think complex thoughts, the ability to plan and look towards the future, the ability to feel pain, whether you understand it? Is it about continuity of an identity over time, or is it merely being alive and breathing? And some people think it's a single criteria, other thinks it's a compound criteria. And then there are complex questions about what happens for th things that have the potential to have capacity X or had capacity X but lost it. So for example, uh, a fetus doesn't have the ability, as early fetus, let's just say an embryo just to, to make it very easy, an embryo before 14 days doesn't have the capacity to think deep thoughts about the future or have future orientation. I think that's pretty well accepted by everyone. But it certainly has the potential to do so, right? And the question is, is that enough? What kind of theory of potentiality? You know, hydrogen and oxygen each have the potential together to become water, but does that mean that they are water, they have the metaphysical properties of water? Or do we require more of a kind of potentiality, something like in the natural course of things, you will become something? The other difficult set of categories are things that once had the capacity, but now no longer have it, and perhaps never will again. So those that are brain dead, for example, are a good example. They are certainly human beings, they, most cases, they have been persons, but now if your capacity for personhood, how you define personhood, is something like uh, the capacity to think deep thoughts about the future or to have future orientation, these are entities that no longer have that capacity and we don't believe we'll have it again. Do they cease being persons at that point? So this is to say that in order to understand whether a fetus or an early embryo, the kind that are used for stem cell derivation, is a person, you have to do a lot of metaphysical work in understanding what makes something a person and why and what those capacities are. Now, even if you think something is a person, that doesn't necessarily mean you've solved the abortion problem. So it is possible, although popular among philosophers, not so popular in the political press, to say fetuses are persons and yet abortion is still legal and justified. How does that argument go? The suggestion is that there is a, uh, a right of another entity that has overcome whatever interest the fetus has. And that is the right typically of the mother who is gestating uh, the fetus. So the claim is, yes, a fetus is a person. Yes, abortion will cause the death of a person. But that doesn't mean that abortion is wrong because the woman gestating the fetus has a right to stop that gestating, even if it will result in the death of a person. 
And the most famous version of this argument comes from Judith Jarvis Thompson, a very famous uh, thought experiment about the world's most famous violinist. And she says, imagine you find yourself, you had a heavy night of drinking, you got drunk, you blacked out, and you wake up the next morning and you find yourself a human dialysis machine hooked up to the world's most famous violinist. Nobody doubts the violinist is a person, right? He's a, not only a person, a great person, the world's most famous violinist. But she says, don't you have the right to unplug yourself from that person, even if it will turn out that it will result in the death of the violinist? And she says, if you think the answer is yes, then you think that even though the entity is a person, you may have a right to cause its death, a right to unplug itself. And she analogizes that to the right of a mother to unplug herself from her fetus, who is a person. Now, there's lots of contestation about that thought experiment, right? You might say, you got drunk, no fault of your own, somebody kidnapped you. Is that really the situation of all women who become pregnant? Or is it the situation only of women, uh, for example, who are raped or who are uh, you know, impregnated in an unconscious state? But this is just to show that there's some complexity here. Okay, one more point. That is that the stem cell question looks different on this regard. Remember, when we're talking about embryos, we're talking about embryos that are frozen, that are in a lab, nobody is gestating them. If embryos have the rights of persons, unlike in the case of abortion, there's nobody who has a contrary right to stop gestating them. So you might actually think the argument for a prohibition against destroying early embryos is easier than the argument for prohibiting abortion for this reason. Now, on the flip side, you might think the early embryos have even less of the capacity X, whatever that is, than does the fetus. But this is the way in which bioethicists and lawyers think about these problems. Mm -hmm.